My name is Claire Aguilar. I'm the Director of Programming and Industry Engagement. And I'd like to welcome you to our panel today where we have, we're going to discuss, the title of the panel is called How to Get Your Theatrical Doc Funded. But it's actually much more than that. It's about how films have been uh, with the age of new technology, new distribution venues, and, and also ways of production that people have been managed to work in the industry to get funded, to get produced, and also to get distributed. So um, uh, before we start the panel, we have um, a number of esteemed panelists, and so I'd just like to introduce them briefly, and they'll, they'll talk about what they do and uh, show some of the work they've been working on uh, for a few. And then afterward, we can open it up to questions. Um, everybody here is, has a slightly different angle in their approach to documentary, but I think you'll see it's a little bit of like um, nose to tail. So um, not that I want to start with the nose, but <laughs> I don't want to, <laughs> to the left, to the left of me, uh, I'll just start to the left of me. <laughs> is um, Simon Chin? He's a he's a, a producer for Redbox Films. Uh, very um, he's showing a film here at Docfest, a My Scientology movie directed by John Dower, featuring Louis Theroux, also known for the amazing uh, films like Searching for Sugar Man and um, many more productions that have gone through theatrical and also to television. Um, and next to Simon is Kate Townsend, who's the executive editor or executive producer. <laughs> Your executive Whatever. everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, she is the be all and end all of BBC Storyville. Uh, Kate is working with Storyville to commission a creative documentary that is on television, but also has many, many lives in theaters and um, is really involved in the curating of the season and as well as the creation and producing of the documentaries on Storyville. So, welcome. Next to Kate is John Hoffman, who is the executive VP of Documentaries and Specials at Discovery in the United States. Um, this, is a, this is a new position for uh, very high impact documentaries that concentrate on uh, special themes. So um, even though John has a really great background working at HBO for many, many years, and has been involved also as executive producer on many documentaries. But this venture at Discovery is something where you're, you're able to commission and also to uh, distribute on Discovery and Animal Planet and also, the, what's, the other, what's the other arm of? Science. Science on, on Discovery. Um, next to John is Ali Harbottle, who is the head of distribution at Dog Wolf, uh, and which is just an amazing distributor. We like to joke that we call Dogfest Dog, Dog Wolf Dogfest because <laughs> we have so many wonderful titles from this distributor. And um, working with filmmakers on the um, commissioning process, but also in the distribution process to festivals and to theatrical. And then finally, we have Liz Wood, Elizabeth Wood from Doc, Doc House uh, in London, really great curator of a venue that's devoted exclusively to documentaries. So we have an interesting array of people if you really go through the spectrum, not only in the creation of the documentary, but also into the, um, into the distribution and exhibition. And also, it, it could be relevant for filmmakers at any stage. So one of the questions that we talked about is um, in terms of what everybody does, and it's very different, is to think about and I ask all the panelists to think about it, is what, how do you, what is your measure of success in what you do, whether you're in the producing, whether you're in distribution, or if you're doing commissioning? And also, how does that relate to your sustainability model? And by that, I mean, how does that relate to how you're able to do the day-to-day, -day, but also look toward the future and what you're able to continue doing the work you do? How does, you, how does that sustain? So I want to start with Simon and see what his thoughts are on that. Okay, um, it's a difficult question to answer because I think there, there are many, so many different measures of success, um, just sort of personally, but there are also you know, different measures of success according to the different kinds of projects that, that, that I do. And, and you know, uh, these days I'm doing more and more um, d different kinds of projects for different platforms, you know, working in television for nonlinear platforms, 
theatrical films. Um, but I guess, you know, when I thought about answering the question, uh, the one thing I did want to say was that the, the real measure of success is, is a sort of creative one. It's like, you know, am I, am I happy with the film? I mean, you know, uh, did, did the film in some way sort of fulfill the potential that I, I first saw in, in the story? Did, did, it, did it kind of somehow meet the, the sort of hazy, hazy first vision that I, I had for it? Um, and, and, you know, am I, am, I, am I happy? Am I fulfilled? Am I, am I excited about it? Um, and then I guess it's a little bit about, you know, because you know, we don't make films just for ourselves. I mean, it's about, you know, about, about you, about audiences, and, you know, did, did, it, did it connect with an audience? You know, th those are the real, certainly in kind of theatrical feature docs, which, you know, the business model of which I would say is, you know, it's sort of, it's mixed. I mean, you know, if you went into every theatrical feature doc wanting to make a lot of profit, you should probably give up. Um, not to say that's not possible, but um, <laughs> but um, so, so yeah. In the in the end, those kinds of projects are they are a little bit passion projects. They you know they're about they're about um, <clears throat> and they take a very long time. You know, they take a hell of a long time. Extremely arduous. So if there isn't creative fulfilment at the end of it, um, then it's really not worth doing. But is your question really about money? Well, why don't we take an example of my Scientology movie? How would you <laughs> apply that to you? Are you happy with that? Okay, the, the measure of success <laughs> on that one was that I basically got, got together with Louis, who I've known for a very long time. And, and you know, Louis, uh, it turns out, always, unsurprisingly, always wanted to make a, a feature doc, a theatrical feature doc. And so it's very much part of his, his game plan. And I, I, I thought, well, wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't it be fun to kind of try and figure out with Louis um, what the sort of theatrical version of a, of, a, of a Louis Theroux film is? And the BBC were sort of crazy enough to back us because we didn't have any access. We had no, no idea whatsoever what, what film we were, in, we were, we were going to be able to make. Um, and Charlotte Moore, Christine Langer, and Joe Oppenheimer, and BBC Worldwide, um, amazingly, um, backed us, and backed us very well, and we set about the process of, of making it. So, I mean, I think the end game of that was, creatively, was, was you know, do we have a film? And I'm, I'm delighted, actually, it was an amazing process. It took a very long time, and, uh, and it was an, a, an amazing collaboration with me, Louis, and John Dower. Uh, it was just a hell of a lot of fun. But it was incredibly <laughs> arduous, and then the kind of end, the end, the end game beyond that is actually on that film was, was you know, th there were some challenges. I mean, you know, Alex Gibney made a film, had made a film about Scientology, mm -hmm. um, which certainly queered our pitch for a while. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of the distribution community, theatrical distribution community, were nervous about about Louis. Do people want to go to the cinema? Pay to go to go to the cinema to see a Louis Theroux documentary? Um, that was, I think, a big question for people. Um, so, so it was like, you know, how do we somehow overcome these, these challenges? And, and overcoming the challenges, I, I, I felt, was about getting people's eyeballs on the film, getting people to see the film in a cinema, getting them to hear the amazing score, to, to see the kind of unusual techniques that we deployed in the film. And I think, actually, we were able to kind of overcome people's nervousness. And we've now sold the film to Altitude in the UK, to Magnolia in the US, to Mad Men in, in Australia. And, you know, it's, it's going to have a sort of proper theatrical life. Uh, will it make money on the back end? Remains to be seen. I mean, actually, I think in the end, that film, that film will probably largely get sold, you know, other than sort of certain kind of key territories, get sold to, to television. Which, which I think increasingly is a sort of the journey that many docs go on. They have a kind of, you know, really good mm. sort of yeah. theatrical platform, theatrical launch, and then, and then they sort of go to other, other platforms, VOD and television. And, 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 and I think you know, Louis has a huge sort of global market, to, you know, for his, for his television shows, well-established broadcasters who are used to acquiring his films. And I, I think that once Hanway have sold the theatrical, then, then BBC Worldwide will sort of step in and sort of do that <coughs> television. Okay, you've done that. Does that yes, does that's the trajectory. Should yeah. we take a look at it? You have a, you oh, have yeah. a clip. Good. 
See, that, that's a measure of success. The fact that you laughed gives me great pleasure. Okay, that's one measure of success. Also, the happiness of filmmakers. You went through yes. a kind of trajectory of, in terms of you know how it started and just measuring along the way. So it was kind of interesting. Right. You can track it. Yeah. Um, well, let's move on to Kate, who is at the sort of at the middle part of this trajectory, if you want. But um, you could talk about well. You know, what is, your, what is your measures of success? And you can talk about it at different phases, you know, either at the commissioning <clears throat> phase or at the um, transmission phase. Yeah. I mean, I think fundamentally for us, the measure of success, I think we have two different criteria. One is the type of film that we just want people to see documentaries. So we want films that people talk about and get good ratings, basically. That is one measure of success for us. And in the mix, we're always looking for those black fishes, those noisier films that we know are going to get um, ratings for the subject matter. India's Daughter, um, that we showed here last year, was, was big for us, partly because of the you know, political maelstrom that ensued. But it, it meant that people were talking about the film. It had a huge amount of viewers to it, a huge amount of online traffic afterwards. So that obviously is one measure of success. We want our <coughs> films like Gaddafi and Bare Knuckle Boxing and things that bring a broad audience um, to documentaries, because we don't want it to be seen as feature docs and Storyville as a kind of elite niche strand. Um, so we want people to come to those films for the second kind of criteria that we're always doing, which is loosely sort of reputational, but it comes down to what Simon was saying as well about pushing the boundaries back. Um, it's an amazing opportunity of our strand that we can have license to experiment and take some risks with, with young first-time filmmakers, which we, which we do, um, and with form as well. So um, there's things like um, Notes on Blindness that's here that um, is obviously experimental in form with inexperienced directors. We can do those kinds of films, but at the same time, we can also come in early on things like The Penny Bakers, Unlocking the Cage, which has been a three, four year process. And yeah, that's an incredibly satisfying <coughs> thing to see that have its journey and, and, and come to Sundance and then, and then here and to provoke debates and arguments. It was amazing in the, in the Q&A last night, there was um, a collective groan of disappointment when the Q&A finished. And I thought that is a measure of success, that there's a real, it's a talk about film that people want to, want to pursue the, the arguments that are, are raised in the film. How good are you at predicting um, big audience hits or high, high rating films? And Because you're saying you use that to balance against the films that have a high risk potential or yeah. even though they're experimental and they're very challenging yeah. or if they can be innovative yeah. in content, yeah. you're not sure of the ratings of those. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's an inexact science. I mean, it, it, it does come down to some basic things like tweaking the title sometimes and I mean, this is where it's different to a cinema audience, because often what we will do is tweak the title for our TX, um, you know, unashamedly so. We had a beautiful lyrical film here by a first-time director, um, In the Shadow of the Sun. Well, Claire, you were involved in that one. And we called it, um, and it did very well, and actually nearly beat um, Sugar Man at Idfa for the Audience Award. I mean, it's a beautiful film. But um, that title meant nothing to our audience. Mm -hmm. So we called it Albino Witchcraft Murder. Um, and it got lots of ratings because we want people to watch these films. They deserve mm -hmm. to be seen. So um, we'll do what we can with titles to draw people in to, to films. It is difficult to predict sometimes. Obviously, if it's a con you know, I'm always saying to people, we'll, we'll, controversial figures always do well for us. People that you think you know, but actually there's more insight to be had. The Gaddafi film we did did very well. And big um, access-driven pieces. Um, Simon was involved with um, the Bolshoi Babylon. Um, and obviously that was an astonishing time mm. to go into the Bolshoi. It was the season after the acid attack, when the, mm -hmm. it was recovering from this awful trauma of the attack on the creative director. So mm. clearly that was, you know, the Bolshoi resonates for people, let alone the fact that it, it was, it was on, the, on the tails of this, this scandal. So you, you sort of know that's going to be a film that is going to interest people, but, you know, whether that's going to be a massive hit or a medium hit, that was difficult to predict. And do you look at that as you balance your slate and your season? Is that how important is that? It is important to balance that because I think if we just if we, we need a few ones that we can stake that are, are you know not not sure fires, but you know films that we feel quite strongly are going to be solid and attract viewers to justify being able to take the risks on the other ones. I think most people 
have that as their business. Yeah. But the, the Bolshoi film actually is an interesting case study. Mm. I won't talk about it for long because I know others. Yeah. others yeah. Talk, but um, we actually, on the strength of the, 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 the proposition mm. and, and a brilliant um, sort of sizzle reel that, yeah. that, that Nick Reed mm. did um, based on some film, early filming at the Bolshoi, we actually took that film with Altitude as a, a sales agent to, to Berlin and, 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 and did sort of something like $400,000 of, of theatrical pre-sales mm -hmm. just on the idea. And that, that's, that's a new, that's another measure of success, I guess, but it's, it's a, that's a new thing, I think, for, for docs to be able to sort of pre-sell in that way. And it does sort of show you how the market has, has changed, theatrical market has changed for docs, because that never used to be possible. It was, wasn't possible mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And, and we've, we've actually done the same thing with a, f a film we're doing about Whitney Houston, directed by Kevin MacDonald, which we've just taken to Cannes and essentially raised the entire budget through theatrical pre-sales oh, without having shot really frame. Great. Whitney <laughs> Houston, yeah. uh, Kevin MacDonald, okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you, uh, Kate, do you, want, do you have any examples, any video examples you'd like to show? Or you want oh, well, to I wanted to show, I mean, yeah, I've got, I've got one clip. I mean, this, is, this fits into sort of the reputational taking risk side. It's a director that actually Kevin MacDonald recommends... Um, came our way a few years ago, um, and she'd only done a five-minute film, a lovely film called Hackney Lullabies, about women from different nationalities singing their <coughs> national lullabies to their children. It was very sweet, but she came and she made a film about her aunt. Claire, you were involved in that film? My Atomic Aunt, were you involved yes. in that? Yes, Kyoga Son. Yeah. yeah. So um, she's basically done two beautiful um, storyvilles, and this is her third storyville she's doing. And this actually, this is... I just asked her to take a bit from the edit. I mean, it's, this is from Rough Cut. I just thought we'd want a sneak preview of something. So it's a film called, working title is Tokyo Girls. This is really, this is just a sort of assembly of something we saw last week. And it's, it's about the J-pop industry um, in Japan. And it's this um, very specific form of pop singers, all young girls between usually 14 and 18, and about their relationship with their middle-aged male fans. That's really the premise of the film. She's been tracking some of these girls, um, including the one you're going to see t um, for about a year and a half. But really, it's shining a light on gender politics in Japan, why this country is suffering from the lowest birth rate and, and exploring notions of feminism um, in Japan. So <coughs> Kyoko did this. She's off on shooting now, actually. We'll get a, a, some more follow-up this week. But I, just, it's the th I think it's about three minutes of okay. something. Tokyo Girls. Tokyo Girls. By Kyoko Miyaki. By Kyoko Miyaki. I mean, it's not, it's not a weird weekend thing. It's not as sort of weird as that clip actually suggests. I mean, they have every year in um, their Guardian equivalent in Japan, they have a big vote with all these women, the girls' pictures, and you've got to vote <coughs> the team out. And so it's very much part of national culture there, um, which that's how Kyoko's framing it and using the phenomena as a vehicle to explore society. So that's what the film's about. Come that's to your a great example. Next year. So that's in mid-production, and then yeah. you're going to see. And is it scheduled to f deliver when? She's um, um, editing till about autumn, and then looking. I mean, this is how we, you know, she's editing till autumn, looking for a festival premiere early next year. I mean, Simon knows. I mean, you know, we, you, you deal with the festival timetabling, so depending on which festival she hopes he gets into early next year, we always allow windows because we want the film to get out there. So we're, you know, going to be playing it, you know, a bit later next year. Okay, so broadcaster who's um, looking for broadcast TX, but also for allowing for a festival and theatrical possible window. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, let's move on to John Hoffman, Working with Discovery. And um, you asked me when we were organizing this, it's like, well, we're, we're kind of a little out of the box. We're not really, we're not working in theatrical. We're working in, we're working in a, a, a broadcast model. But I think what you want to do at Discovery with this new venture is something really interesting. In, in this festival, we're showing uh, your first commission for Animal Planet. It's a 40-minute film called Toucan Nation. Um, it's, it's a wonderful animal rights film about a, a, a toucan in Costa Rica named Grecia who becomes abused and through technology, through 3D laser printing, a beak is manufactured to replace poor Grecia's beak who has not been able to sing or eat and suddenly everything. So it's a happy ending animal rights film. <laughs> but why, why 30 minutes and what's the strategy behind that commission? 
John? Um, well, the um, desire to um, ha get it to 40 minutes um, is because we think it's a, just a fantastic film. The Paola Heredia, who's here, um, directed the film. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. And it not only um, tells the moving story of one bird, but really elevates the discussion, I think, on an international level about um, how we um, treat animals and that the abuse of animals um, can really be at the beginning of a scale of violence in a culture that extends to humans as well. So the opportunity when you hear a story that has you know, a natural structure to it, um, you just leap. And so um, Powell and I both heard the story independently um, and um, immediately connected, and I was delighted to know that she already had some ins with the people in Costa Rica who were starting to follow the story, and then sh we just sent her there and said, you know, just go. Um, so I hope people get a chance to see it. It will be a television one hour on Animal Planet. It'll air all over the world. Um, but um, we want to have it in shorts festivals as well, and if it can have a life um, with, you know, towards an Oscar short, that would be wonderful. Um, so that's a motivation to have it here as an uninterrupted 40-minute short. Yeah, and we should clarify, you know, that um, it, is in, it is in the shorts competition here, and so if it does uh, garner the award, then it would qualify for the Oscar for in the shorts category. Mm. Right. And for the Academy, <coughs> um, the, uh, the length for a short is 40 minutes, right. correct? And, and less, yeah. Yeah, and less. And so is there a broadcast date set for this? So it's um, August 2nd in the States. Okay. Um, and how does that fit into your overall strategy of what's happening at, at Discovery? So um, I've been at Discovery for a year and a half, and um, I have been given just, a, I think, an amazing opportunity to um, bring back, in some regards, um, the documentary form to a company that has, obviously, many channels uh, in the States and around the world. Um, and so it's a very big entertainment company um, with lots of different outlets. Um, but the documentary form, which really is in the, you know, the, the DNA of the company, but had been dormant. Um, I think that a lot of filmmakers are, you know, were aware of that and had seen the discovery sort of network of channels you know, really drift um, all the way over to reality television. And there was a recognition um, by the leadership at the very top that there needed to be a rebalance. Um, and so I was asked to come in, um, I think in large part because of my experience at HBO um, and really learning how um, documentaries can be brand definitional. Um, and so the learning curve, I think, for the company, which you know, has a relatively young group of people who were there who weren't necessarily there in the days of Grizzly Man or Man on Wire. Um, and so there was a learning curve, I think, for everyone about how to acquire, how to manage the launch of a film. Um, I had the very uh, stunningly good fortune of um, Racing Extinction premiering at Sundance. Um, days, I mean literally probably five days after I started the job. Um, we knew about the film, um, had, had been talking to John Sloss and Luis Ahoyos about the film um, once we saw it in the catalog and I hadn't even started working yet. Um, and we were very fortunate to get the international rights for that. And the amazing thing about Racing Extinction, if you haven't seen it, this is um, the Oscar, um, made by the Oscar winning filmmaker Luis Ahoyos. Um, and the projections that Louis um, did all over the world on the Empire State Building, on the Vatican, um, were this remarkable, was, was a remarkable way of building awareness for the film. Um, <clears throat> and the film tells the story of the great risk that the world is you know, under of total ecological collapse because of various forces that are causing the oceans to suffer, acidification of the oceans, overfishing, and that this notion of the sixth extinction is you know, a scientifically valid you know, hypothesis. Um, so that's, that's the nature of the film. It was a bullseye for the Discovery Channel and brand. Um, and so 
um, it helped me learn to work <coughs> with all of my colleagues all over the world about launching this big documentary that, in partnership with Vulcan, we were able to have a substantial impact campaign, um, and there was a sizable marketing budget internationally. Um, so it really sort of, it raised the bar, and it set a rather high watermark for what documentaries can do. It had a 36 million people tuned in all around the world. We aired it in prime time, starting in New Zealand and going around the world in one day, 195 countries. So it just shows the power of you know, a big entertainment company. Me learning to work on that scale was fascinating. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever find another film that matches that, um, which is scary in some regards. Um, but I think that the idea that for me in terms of how do you measure success, your, you know, your question, it's, it really showed that one film can draw an audience, it can create remarkable buzz, which is a measure of success, it can garner awards, another measure of success, it can generate huge amounts of press, another you know, measure, and then the last is impact. And so that became that sort of five point sort of plan for Eddie Film. This became the way that the entire company came to understand documentaries. So, um, and there has to be a range. You can't, you can't do all racing extinctions because you can't afford all of them. That, that was a big buy. Um, and so you, you, know, you have to have a, you know, an approach which has a scale <coughs> of acquisitions similar to what you're talking about. Um, and you might have a film that's a much smaller film that will do tremendously well in social media or impact. And it's, I'm working for a company that has to learn really how to sort of, in some ways, you know, commodify that and understand how to monetize that. Because at the end of the day, it is, I work for a, you know, an ad-supported, entertainment company that has to show a return on investment for every, you know, every program that we buy or commission. So, can, I, can I ask you a question? Um, in that kind of case study that you gave of racing, <coughs> do you think there was any sort of trade-off for the filmmakers who I imagine sort of set about the film sort of wanting it to have a theatrical life right. um, in, in, in going with a sort of broadcast model with Discovery, which, which you articulated, sounds like it was very big. Um, but, but I sound wondering what that trade-off is for filmmakers and whether you're, that's well, something you, you had to persuade them, obviously make there was no, with your check. There was no persuasion because Louis wants to change the world. Right. That's his measure of success, that he, is, that he personally is waging a battle to save the oceans. But do you think if, if that film had had a significant <laughs> theatrical life globally, it would have kind of somehow entered the bloodstream in a different way. You know, we were talking about that prior. Um, you know, this was a discussion, this was an eternal discussion at HBO with Sheila. Eternal. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> the discussion applies at Discovery as well. We had that discussion. We are very open, and, and Louis, we, Louis had a brief theatrical, um, and many other films that we are, you know, we've commissioned, we're allowing the filmmakers to have a brief theatrical. I think that the, the press, the way it has been organized for a long time, the mainstream press, not, I don't think that bloggers really you know, um, fall into this category, but the mainstream press, the New York Times will only talk about a film once, okay? So you release it theatrically, six months, three months, whatever it is before the broadcast, that's the hit. And so some of the most important outlets that will write about a film, the timing is off, okay? If you're in the television business and you want to get a television audience, that press attention is going to a theatrical for which so few people are gonna go. Yeah. Um, yet the awareness building that goes on with that press 
you know, is very good. And it's nice to see that a film that you love is getting you know, a good amount of attention, either a feature article or, and or a review. But you are possibly compromising the audience for the television because you're not syncing up that sort of unpaid promotion. Because, you know, Racing Extinction, the company spent money to market it. They paid money to generate an audience, right? That's rare at HBO. One, maybe two films a year that Sheila puts on has a marketing budget attached to it. So how else are people going to know about it? If they're not seeing a billboard, if they're not seeing an, a banner ad you know, on their tablet, how else do they know about it? If they're not watching the network and seeing the promos on the network, it's through you know, unpaid media. And so you want to generate as much of that as possible <coughs> you know, through, obviously, social media now is you know, a remarkable tool for that. Um, just the way you were describing how you generate you know, buzz. So, you know, you, you have to weigh pros and cons of the timing of that. We're going to, I, I'm not going to talk about the name, but we have a film, uh, incredibly unusual, fun, fun documentary that's going to come on this fall, where it will have a midnight run, three, week, three, three weekends in a row leading up to its broadcast. It's an incredibly purposeful theatrical release to build attention. Mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, it's, 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 it's a marketing ploy. How many people will go in the few cities where we put that film? You know, it's not going to compromise our audience, but it will get talked about. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a really important point to make is that it's a theatrical platform, but for docs, is usually a marketing platform. Right. Mm. It doesn't it tend to kind of make Because, Kate, money. you do that, don't you? You, you have uh, theatrical windows before you put things. Yeah, yeah, we do. But, but do you find that works for you? Well, I mean, it, I, 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 I sympathise and I'm in the same position as you because you're torn between wanting to... Well, you're torn anyway. You want the, the, to do right with the filmmakers and want them to have their theatrical moment. Um, but the, 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 the money, is, as you say, really, they tend to just spike for a weekend anyway. So, you know, Oli knows I've been pushing for, you know, slightly compressed windows because of the publicity thing. We've done it with a few things. We did it last year with um, Syrian Love Story, where it went out, it had a massive burst at South Bank, went everywhere for a week, and then we put it out. But that meant all that amazing publicity um, that the BBC can mobilise on their news site, everywhere, is, is put to... That golden light at cinemas now and on Storyville next week, you know. So it it, it was a sort of win-win all round, but it is very difficult to get the distributors and the people that have invested, frankly, more than us. We're, that's we don't have much leverage, as well, because we're not very rarely ever majority funders. So it it's a constant game. What what I tend to do with Storyville when I'm going through it, and you're right because they won't the press won't come twice, and they st they won't in England as well. So. I try and make sure that within one run, I put one documentary near the front that hasn't had a theatrical, that actually can get talked about. So it signifies to people a run started. So we had this amazing um, film called The Biggest, what, what do we call it in the end? The World's Most Expensive Party, about the Shah of Iran putting on this huge party in the desert. And that didn't have a, a, a theatrical run. And that, for me, was really useful because we could get the press behind it, put it near the front of the, the story of a run to signal we're, we're on a run. And then all the other wonderful films that have had um, theatricals can follow on um, from that. But it's, it's tricky, and it's something that Ollie and I are constantly talking about, aren't we? Yes, um, a lot. We did it last Let's week again, didn't we? Ollie and the distribution landscape. Thank you, John, for articulating that. That's really great. But that spins into the whole distribution, not only timing, but also you know, how do you kind of mm. stagger what the releases get out and what kind of attention. So... What is that strategy at Dogbiff, and what is that? What is your measure of success? Is it only um, at the tail end? I mean, as an independent business, there's obviously an obligation of commercial success. So, for us, success is intrinsic, intrinsically linked with will the film make money, um, and that's that's just a, a fact of being an independent business. The 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 term theatrical doc is a slight misnomer. I think it is. It's, that's not where the money is made, and, I, and <coughs> it's already been addressed. It's, it's completely an awareness platform. So for us, a successful distribution strategy is really 
looking at the whole life of the film from the outset and working out those windows um, to broadcast, but also increasingly so to uh, digital platforms and, and DVDs. So we're very, we're very strategic in kind of making sure our films are up for pre-orders and kind of that's a, that's a way we measure success. So when a film is released in the cinemas, we're looking at how many pre-orders we've had on iTunes or on Amazon for DVD, because that's, that's the purpose of us doing theatrical. I mean, I, say, I would say one in 10 films makes money at the box office theatrically. Um, it's a very expensive exercise to get films out there. Prints and advertising, we only take 35% of the box office, which general public often don't know, so they see box office figures, but actually we take 35%. Um, so it's often <coughs> just a, it's a, a break-even scenario at best. So for us, we really have to work out how we're going to monetize this film and make it a, a financial success for us. So increasingly, we're looking at collapsed windows, uh, day and date releases where we <coughs> release at the same time in cinemas and on digital platforms, often doing short windows to DVD, often working with broadcasters and the SVOD platforms for a kind of short, plat uh, short window there. Um, so that's... That, that's how we measure success, kind of looking at the outset. Well, what <coughs> can we monetize this? Um, I mean, in terms of the theatrical experience, I mean, success is measured by um, editorial coverage, it's press, it's social media. Um, and then I would say there's also another element of success, especially in the documentary space, which is social impact. Um, because that's obviously, this is the genre where social, social impact films are made. So for us, for example, we did Blackfish two years ago. Um, and that's had a visible social impact. Uh, SeaWorld's obviously changed its policy. They kind of, their share value went down through the roof. And that, that is in itself a success as well. And the good thing about that film is it made lots of money as well. So that was a successful run. Do you have to balance in the same way that Kate does in terms of the films that you think are going to be monetized or particularly profitable as well as the ones that are risky or the ones that you may think you may not do as well? Yeah, I mean, we, we can only do so many films a year. We do 18 films theatrically in the UK, which is itself a stretch. Um, we need a few of them to kind of be your big tentpole big hitters, so the Michael Moore film should turn a healthy profit. But then we do, we do often back kind of the small independent stuff, the more experimental <coughs> stuff, and the remit for those ones is often kind of awards and prestige to kind of because that that's also helps the reputation of the company and building relationships with filmmakers. Um, so yeah, we, we do have the ability to work with the smaller titles as well, but we'd still want that to make some money at least. That sounds good. Well, let's go to the kind of the, the our last panelist, Elizabeth Wood from Doc House. <laughs> You're an exhibitor, but an unusual one at that. Um, in that, um, you are a for-profit exhibitor. On the other hand, you are sustained by a foundation. Um, how does that work? How does that balance together? Um, well, uh, we are funded. I was originally Doc House, which was an independent organization that ran on volunteers. And then I was given funding by the Bertha Foundation to establish an organization to develop uh, showing documentaries in the cinema, and that organization also invested in the Curzon Cinemas, and as part of that deal, <clears throat> they leased one of the screens that is part of the Curzon Bloomsbury uh, as a screen that would be dedicated, first in the UK, to showing only documentaries. And that's what I run. It's completely independent of the funding we answer to the Bertha Foundation, and it's our uh, sustainability, if you like. The premise that I have is that I have to increase the audience, have as many people as possible coming to the cinema, as many people as possible watching the films. It's not so much because I have um, funding from the Bertha Foundation to keep the, the core funding, it's not so much that we need to charge 18 pounds a ticket uh, to see a documentary, but it is an absolute priority that we fill the cinema. So we, can, we have charged less for people to come to the cinema in order to build an audience, which is basically our premise. To build the audience for documentaries, uh, theatrical documentaries, creative visual documentaries in the cinema. 
and we do that in various ways. Uh, I feel like I'm at the sharp end of this tail, or the tail of the sharp end or something here, because, I mean, we're about the things that everybody else has been talking about, and we're about showing them in the cinema and getting an audience to come and see them, because we believe that's a unique experience, people gathering together to see dogs. Um, we manage to uh, keep our numbers high by mixing what is a priority for me, which is to show great documentaries, some of which you'll see here at Sheffield, which you certainly see at IFA and at Sundance, which are not picked up by you guys, and which otherwise would not be seen. So I run a program which does quite a lot of work with Dogwolf, and from the <clears throat> from the films that Dogworth picks and selects, we try to show and mix those which have good, as we call, assets. They're backed by the distributor, they're publicized by the distributor. We um, can be pretty sure that we'll get a decent audience for that, and then we'll mix that across with a film that may come from a filmmaker and have no quad no press, nothing. And so, actually, in terms of running the cinema, almost 50% of our time is spent marketing and trying to grow an audience, because that's the bottom line. We believe that good documentaries, quality documentaries, will get an audience in the cinema, and we have survived a year. So, it's looking positive. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Good. Do you have some examples you want to show of, of the work at Dockhouse? Yeah, we do. We um, <clears throat> because we pick up documentaries that actually haven't any distributor in the UK. We um, find some that we register with the FDA, which means that they get on the release calendar and that other, we can get some press around it. And two of the films I would show to you are examples of what we have picked up and has done quite well. Um, in our cinema, the and actually in other cinemas too, afterwards. So basically we're acting as a kind of mini distributor at that level. And so the first one I'm going to show you is 1971, not the fiction film, um, which was about Bella Poitras, and was about um, a nice piece of terrorism in 1971. So if we could show that. Okay, so that's a film that we showed and, and did rather well. We, just to say to everyone, we really are interested in not one particular genre. I think everybody knows it. I mean, we go across genre. So um, I'm actually going to show a different film second. Not, I was going to show Motley's Law, which was another film <clears throat> that we put on the FDA and did quite well. But just in contrast to that film, which is obviously docudrama and uh, was quite successful, we're going, I'd like to show you... Um, uh, an, ex an absolutely out there, anthropological, wonderful, beautiful film called Summer Pasture, which also did quite well. Hmm. And no one else showed. <laughs> so those two films, hmm. 1971... I wonder what his measure of success is. <laughs> did we produce enough yak's butter this week? He has a small chubby girl, the pale chubby girl, which is really great. <laughs> So Summer Pasture in 1971, very, very different films. You're saying that they both did well in terms of audience at Doc House, right? Well, we did, what happens with, it depends how many times we show the films. The um, Summer Pasture we showed as part of a world story strand so that you prepare the audience for the kind of film that you're going to show as one of a season of films. So we showed it three times. Uh, 1971, we showed across the board the splits across a week. So they had different results, but they do, both did quite well. And, you know, I was going to show you others that are quite different. We, Queen of Syria did remarkably well. Uh, Queens of Syria, which is about women in a Syrian refugee camp um, doing Euripides. Um, beautifully, and it's very expressive of the situation of Syrian refugees without being on the nose, and it's rather beautiful. It did remarkably well for us. So it's, uh, to a degree, unpredictable, and what we try to do is mix those films in between a couple of uh, dog woofs, <laughs> where we know that we will definitely 
be able to get um, an audience across a week because it's got lots of assets, lots of distribution. Occasionally we work with, with um, Kate from Storyville. Uh, the film um, Syrian Love Story, Sean's film, thanks to Eltham, the producer to a large degree, and thing, did remarkably well. And we showed, as we were discussing, Sherpa across Christmas, for goodness sake. And that did fantastically well for a limited <coughs> time before it went back to them. So we try to mix um, all sources from independent individual directors, giving them a first time opportunity to have a run in the cinema to ob the obvious uh, films from these guys. And I sincerely hope that is sustainable and can continue. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I will be absolutely honest. But it's been very reassuring, actually, because we've been running for a year, four times a day, every day. And we do special events in uh, the biggest cinema, 150 seats. And we can always rely on those to fill when they, like we took the Michael Moore feed on Friday night and had a full house. So, um, we're working it out in a way, but we're pleased with what's happened over the last year and uh, sincerely hope we can continue. Okay, so that's the, that's the tale. I think we've gone our full circle. What can um, I say? <laughs> yeah, I think it's very interesting just to put in a plug. We're working with, with Doc House at Doc Fest yeah. to put in a pick, a best of the Doc Fest. At, so that cycle will continue from the festival into the cinema, the cinema dedicated solely to documentary. So please tell your friends, over a weekend, July 23rd. <coughs> yeah, right, very good. Okay, well, if, if you have anything else, I mean, we should open it up for questions. I'm sure there are lots of questions from the audience who are curious to ask um, people what they've just heard. Any questions now? Um, hi, waving their hand. Yes. Yes, sir. Can you shout? <laughs> um, so, like a lot of people here, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm trying to generate interest for what I would like to be my day in the future. Um, and I tried very hard to get the story to a lot of people who are more experienced than I am. In fact, Claire, you and I had a conversation about this a while ago when I was in early development. I'm just wondering if my freshness from university is going to be prohibitive in me even getting those meetings to discuss, uh, you know, potential funding. Despite the fact that you know uh, I've had a few people who are more experienced than I am tell me that you know it's quite a good idea. There is potential for it to be made. Um, do you think that I'm, I'm going to struggle to get those meetings because I'm quite young? Or can everyone hear that question? He's wondering if he's because uh, he's fresh out of university. Is he going to have? Trouble making contacts, making uh, contacts with the industry, is that a deterrent to his success? Should we, should we answer that? Is that, that question? It's open. Yeah, to yeah, you. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, from from Storyville point of view, I mean, if you've got a strong story and a strong character, um, if your first time, you'd really need to show evidence on a sample reel of the trailer uh, of the character. Um, and that's worked on a number of occasions with us, new directors. But they've, they've, it, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated trailer, but something to show the tone and the character of your main character. If you're a first-time director fresh out, our strategy is to match you. We would then put you with an experienced executive and um, make sure that you had a, a strong editor support. But if, <coughs> if, if, the, if the trailer and treatment um, prove the story, we, you know, then you could get meetings to answer your question. But I don't think you'd get meetings without having evidence of um, the footage, really, frankly, at your level. Yeah, that's, that's from my yeah, point of view. I mean, uh, it is a, it, it must, I guess, feel like a very sort of closed club, you know, the sort of documentary sort of world to, to someone like you, I, I, I guess. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I don't know what your project is, and um, you know, maybe maybe it's the next, the next, the next Amy or the next, you know, Senna. Who knows? I mean, if if it is, I mean, it would be a it'd be a great great shame, wouldn't it, if if it didn't somehow sort of find its way 
through the system. But but I think I, I do think the system is is not great, notwithstanding what what, what Kate said of, of, of sort of allowing people like like you in. Um, so so therefore, I guess yeah, maybe you do have to sort of think about in terms of your strategy of sort of pursuing your your, your vision for the film about about partnering with people to, you know, people with established track records who can help you. Um, but I think you have to be quite careful about who you partner with because the people you partner with may, may themselves have their own ideas about, mm -hmm. about how to pursue your project in a way that might not be totally in sympathy with what you want to do. So, and, and, you know, I was talking to a young filmmaker yesterday, actually, who you know, who's got a bit of experience actually and, 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 and sort of is emerging and she was extremely frustrated at the experience of having partnered with a producer for her project who the broadcaster sort of probably wouldn't have allowed her to direct. Um, but, but nevertheless, I think she felt that she was sort of slightly screwed by, by the producer. <coughs> In the end, the role she ended up, ended up playing on, on, the, on the project and indeed the um, modest sort of kickbacks that she, or, you know, you know the, pr the modest proposal she made to the, the producer about how she might recoup some of her, her, her sort of sweat equity, if you like, it, you know, the, the time that she spent developing it um, were, was, was sort of, she felt very compromised. So listen, I, so I think it's about, I do think for you, it's probably, probably about, about, about partnering with a, with a producer or a production company, as, as Kate said. And, 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 and hope, you know, finding finding a partner who who is in, you know aligned with with what you want to do, and maybe being. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you, do you want to direct the project yourself? Well, that was the initial idea, but I mean, I'm I'm, I'm open to allowing somebody more experienced to, to take it on if they can do the story justice. Absolutely. Right. I mean, a lot of the development, you know, I've tried to do. There are people already attached contributors, some, some sort of semi-high-profile people. It's just, I, I wonder if my lack of experience, even though I actually have a filming competition this year, I don't know if that holds much weight in these sort of things, but um, I wonder if just somebody of, of my kind of greenness is going to struggle to even have a conversation about it. Um, Depends how aggressive you are. <laughs> so I, I'm going I'm to um, take a slightly different tack than you. Um, my view and how I try to um, work with my team is that you never know when the next great film is going to arrive and how it will arrive. And so, you know, every email, every phone call, every conversation coming to something like this is opportunity for us to hear about a story that um, has to be told. Um, and, you know, so we're competitive with, you know, many other networks to find that great story. And it, it, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it, I've really learned through my career, it's, that's what it's about. We're all looking for you know, some, a film that's going to take us you know, into the world of these nomadic herders and take the audience someplace that they've otherwise never gone. Um, and that's what we're all striving for, is to reach that you know, sort of goal um, and have us meet people that we otherwise would never meet. So if you have access, it's access <coughs> is king. It's what it's all about in this world. So um, you know, I, there was a film that I um, helped um, shepherd at HBO called A Rape in a Small Town. This was a film that was being made by a couple from suburban Philadelphia. Um, the husband was a tile setter, laying bathroom tiles, and the wife was a secretary. Um, they read an article about a 79-year-old woman in rural New Hampshire who was brutally raped in her own bed. Horrible, horrible crime. They had never, they were both in their late 40s, had never made a film before, and they jerry-rigged a camera to a three-quarter inch deck. If anybody, that, many of you might not even know what three-quarter inch is. Um, and they started interviewing this woman. They found her, they approached her. The footage, the interview was something unlike anything you'd ever seen. 
this woman telling about the crime. Um, she went on to campaign into her 90s to get the laws changed in the state of New Hampshire um, to protect other women, and she succeeded. And it was just, it was a horrible looking interview. It was just, you know, snowy and, I mean, it was just the quality was, was practically unbroadcastable. But it was unlike anything you'd ever seen. And, you know, they cold called HBO saying, you know, can we send you something to look at? And we take, at HBO, we took every call. We looked at every single thing that came in. And it became a very big feature doc on HBO. So you just never know. And so you have to take no, every I, I conversation. I, I'm, I'm in wholehearted agreement. I'm not sure the system works quite as you, maybe <laughs> your department did. And you are a, a rare creature in the <clears throat> world of, of, of broadcasting. <laughs> Who takes, <coughs> who takes the emails the, the kind of from novice filmmakers you get. Because you reason, never know. No, you're absolutely right. And, and that's how Sugar Man came about with, with me. I mean, basically, I got a cold, cold email from, from a young filmmaker, Malik Benjalil, who, um, you know, who it, was, it was his first feature. And, and you know, could he come and see me? He gave me a, a rather kind of, um, you know, sort of slightly kind of poor summary of, of the film. But it's, it's, it, the story, it sounded intriguing. Right. He'd been making it for for some time and had basically been turned down by everyone for, for sort of for, 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 for finance. And there was just something about, about the email that, that I responded to and then he came and see me and I, he, you know, he was sort of it's called gut. And, you know, it was, and, and it was, that was the journey that, and, and we had, but it was incredibly hard from that point on to still, you know, even though I was involved, you know, to persuade people to back this film. Um, and we did, you know, we absolutely did. And, you know, we went to Sundance and, and, and had a, and went on this incredible journey. Um, but I, I totally agree. I just think I just think that the, the, the world of, of of financing the broadcasting world is actually not great at, at sort of supporting those kinds of opportunities. Actually, right. they don't see them necessarily as opportunities, particularly the, the sort of slightly riskier projects. Um, but. Um, so, so I think I think it's an incredible challenge for right. the kind of young filmmakers to sort of to sort of overcome that. Um, but I, I I think you're absolutely right, and I think broadcasters perhaps need like you know need to be encouraged. And it's great to hear that you're you're you know that you you're looking for those opportunities from kind of new filmmakers. Um, but for the new filmmakers, they they then have to sort of navigate right. the process of doing a deal with with a large organization like like Discovery or HBO and. And you know all, all of that stuff. So, could, could, could I just moment, add to that one small yeah. thing? Because I completely support that. We do masterclass things at, at uh, Doc, Bertha Doc has as well, because part of our um, ethos is young filmmakers. And one of the things we haven't done, we've done camera, we've done sound, we've done directing, but we haven't done producing. And producers, it seems to me, are the golden way to the future for young directors in this country. And there are a dearth of them. And I think it's one of the most, we're no longer in a position where young filmmakers can expect 100% finance from BBC <coughs> or Channel 4 or anyone. And the thing that you most need, because you haven't got a caring commissioning editor most of the time, is to find an empathetic creative producer to work with. And there just aren't enough of those around because we're in a changing world. I was talking to the guys at Doc Campus <clears throat> last night, and they've taken 15 students who get mentored over a year for producing international fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. Not one person from the UK is going there this year, and it should be lots more than that because, to me, that's the future for you, is to get someone to help you because directors are, aren't always good pitchers, pitch makers, they're creative people. And if you have a good, strong producer who can put together the financing, you're in so much stronger position. Okay, so let's take a couple more questions. We have some time. Yes. Hi, I'm Sonia Pemberton from Australia. I've got a question about this hybrid television theatrical hybrid that we seem to be discussing a bit here. Um, if you're used to getting funding through the television model, um, and doing a pre-sale, 
and you're also looking at the theatrical. I'd be interested in the perspective um, of the people on the panel on what is the best window? I know it's a difficult question, but the window between uh, the, how long the theatrical run should be ideally from the producer's mm. point of view and how long it could be from uh, the commissioner's and the broadcaster's point of view. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it depends on the film mm. a lot. And, and these days, you know, Ollie should really talk about this, but the, you know, unorthodox, Sort of windowing, I think, is is sort of for, particularly for for docs is is definitely the in the in the zeitgeist and and, and indeed Oli's talked about a sort of day and date model where you know VOD and, and theatrical can sort of happen almost simultaneously. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for theatrical it is remains to be seen. It may be a good thing for to generate uh, profit, you know, but. Um, you know, I think I think for kind of, there are very few documentaries that sort of warrant a sort of traditional theatrical release. So um, you know, our, our, our <coughs> Whitney Houston doc with Kevin McDonald, because it's it's a sort of tentpole. You know, it, it's going, it's being treated as a sort of tentpole doc that that's going to be released in in much the same way as a as a as a as a proper movie. Um, you know, will I think will have a, th a, tr a traditional theatrical release. We, we, you know, we haven't got any broadcast money in there. It's, it's been entirely uh, the finance has been t raised entirely through th theatrical pre-sales, as I said. So there is no kind of discussion about that. It's going to it's going to be in, in cinemas, I guess, for as, as long as it it can sustain. Um, and the idea is to to, to, to make as much uh, box office theatrically as as it can as it can possibly. But make if you before, need to before, but, but the smaller docs. You know, this is a kind of constant discussion. You know, what what what, what is the kind of appropriate window for a? For gets a, a little a, boring after a while. It's, it gets a little boring. You're right. Maybe we should just stop now, shall we? But I think I think that um, what as as a um, you know someone representing a television network as a you know and and with you know an enormous platform, um, I think that we have to ask the creative community to just remember. If a television network is putting money into it, it's investing in it for its television life. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think the respect that we pay the creative community um, who has a desire to have a theatrical experience for their film, that they, there's something about that that is just imprinted in the culture, that going into that black box, having that communal experience with other people, of, you know, seeing a film and wanting that for your film to have that experience. We have to respect that. Yeah. And I think I that... I completely agree with you. I right. mean, the, the truth of the matter is that, that filmmakers pursue <coughs> theatrical for irrationally. These right. Films. And, and the truth of the matter is that some films, you don't want to go into that black box and be on your own, do you? Um, you know, you want an audience for yeah. your film. Right. And the truth is that increasingly, you know, I think what's interesting about this panel in, in a way is that... Is that there are so many different opportunities to do theatrical feature docs that have, you know, you know, creative integrity as as feature docs. I mean, we're we're doing a film for, for Nat Geo um, about about which is about the LA riots. It's a sort of found footage film. We're working with with Oscar winning directors. Uh, they Nat Geo who, who also are, are, are moving like you towards sort of premium content and and and, and feature docs um, have backed the film fantastically well. And you know, is 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 the model a theatrical model? Maybe there may be a small theatrical platform that they will al allow the film. Um, if, you know, if it, if it feels that it warrants it. But but the truth is that for us, actually, making a great film um, with a broadcaster, you know, who can support it right. and market it, and 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 and, and for it to make it, I'm not not convinced that, that that film necessarily has a kind of obvious theatrical life. So why pursue one, right. therefore? Well, because the more uh, docs you have in the cinema that are visual and creative and interesting, the better. And this kind of closed thing of, it's got to be a big buster in a, you know, mm. uh, it's causing a bit of a problem, actually, because increasingly distributors are looking for films that they think will make big bucks in the cinema. And so consequently, because of Amy and... Senna, yeah. we get Janice, we get, forgive me, a few um, 
Peggy Guggenheim, um, other things, because famous people make big money in the cinema. And that's, from my point of view, um, call me uh, small-minded and creative <coughs> and a bit sort of whatever, uh, I, I want really good documentaries in the cinema. And you, you I do believe them. there's an you audience. You can have them. I guess the question is, is, is the distribution business, I mean, you know, it, in the end, Distribution is a business, and it's a business with extremely precarious margins, right? And and you guys, you guys have to think that there's going to be some sort of advantage. Yeah, you have to take risks as well, because how would you know if you don't take a risk? But, but I think like television. what we're also failing to address here is is the business. Is, the key to the business is the audience. So it's all very well for us to kind of say our opinions, but the audience is king, and we need to accept that the modern day audiences. Um, they need to decide where, when, how, why they're watching films. We can't dictate that anymore by imposing these old traditional windows. And you, you see that in the traditional kind of fiction narrative world, they've really struggled because they haven't addressed that the audience is king. Audiences will make that decision. And I think day and day is absolutely our default position for any release that we can do because it doesn't really impact cinema audiences, but it's a very kind of metropolitan elite mm. network of cinemas where which show documentaries, and that's, that's completely losing 90% of the population. So they want to watch the documentaries as well. So day and date is the fairest, the most open way to hit those audiences and, and to prevent kind of piracy. It's not so much of an issue for us, but... So that's key. And then in terms of DVD window, um, we've kind of seen a six-week uh, window as the kind of golden, golden window period. And then... With TV, we're happy to work two, two three-month windows where possible. I mean, it's important for us when we do that to have a point of difference because once the film's on the BBC and then on the iPlayer, then to the audience, it's essentially free. So mm -hmm. we often look at creating extras packages, uh, both for DVD and for online, which kind of give it a distinct kind of appeal to audiences. But but we are happy to work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's a new territory, isn't it? Because there are d discussions to be had, you know, every time we show Blackfish that your orders of DVDs go up, for example, because, oh, I must get that for my parents. So I think it, it can be a virtuous, not a vicious cycle, the notion that they're all sort of competing against each other. Actually, I think even, even television mm -hmm. can collude with your, with yeah. your DTO. No, no, well, sorry, let's not get technical, but your... Uh, your buying of DVDs or buying of the online version. I mean, where, one area that we are having sort of the stickiness, well, it is, isn't it? It's the streaming rights is the thing that we have quite a lot of discussions about, um, um, uh, meaning um, distinction. It's a bit complex, but iTunes is obviously download to own, like it used to be traditionally a DVD, which is what Ollie's talking about. Um, but streaming is when you can actually just access it, like obviously with Netflix, like a different channel. And for, for the broadcaster, that does get sticky if that's concertina because that's our yeah. window exclusivity. That becomes then a real problem for the distributor, yes. the actual distributor. No, this is the sticky bit of the whole, that's the, not the theatrical bit, that's the sticky bit at yeah. the moment, yeah. just working that new paradigm yeah. out. And it is a new paradigm, and I think everyone's working it through, mm. aren't they? Um, and it's different. It's, there's no model at the moment for that. Maybe there won't ever be. It's, as you're saying, different films suit mm. different different deals. Yeah, but I guess the model is, is slightly being influenced by the, the collapse of the DVD, you know, sort of market and, yeah. and, and the rise of Netflix and, 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 and Amazon and whatnot as, as to kind of replace that, right? I mean, Netflix, I mean, kind of people love them, people hate them in the industry, but they have essentially saved the documentary industry. I think it's fair to say that. I mean, the amount of investment they put into documentaries both in terms of the originals they're commissioning, but also the acquisitions, has really filled the gap that traditional broadcasters left. I mean, beyond Storyville, I mean, it's impossible to get creative feature documentaries mm. on television because everyone prefers factual entertainment for some reason. So Netflix have really kind of come in at a, at a crucial time for the industry, but as a big kind of global business, they're getting more and more aggressive in what they want. So they want to come, become earlier and earlier and, in the new deals that we're seeing, they're only allowing 90 days theatrical window before they go. They'll only allow premium VOD, which means you have to price it at a premium rate on digital platforms. And TV is kind of... 
alongside or not yeah. at all. So that that is definitely the discussion that's been had now, kind of because Netflix have deep pockets and, and it's hard to say no to, to that money sometimes, but it is impacting on the other forms of distribution at the same time. Well, I think we're going to the distribution end of this panel, which I think we have to dedicate to another session, but I think that we've really covered that whole spectrum. There's a, there's a little traffic light that's uh, flashing that is my red traffic light, which means that our time has come to an end, unfortunately, but we'll be hanging around. I want to thank our panelists, Simon Chin, Kate Townsend, John Helfman, Ollie Harbottle, and Liz Wood. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you.